The legal defense of not guilty by reason of insanity is actually used very rarely in the United States. Argued in less than 1-3% to of cases is successful in less than 1% of cases, although certain high-profile cases or its treatment on television and in film seems to exaggerate the use of that defense. The defense is actually quite old. It's described in the Code of Hammurabi nearly 4,000 years ago. But it developed slowly in the United States and in the middle of the 19th century offered quite the sensation. Because the first argument in a United States court of defense by reason of temporary insanity occurred in a case involving United States congressmen and some of the most important political figures of the day. It was a sensation at the time, but caught up in the events of the United States at the time, it's nearly forgotten today. And still, the curious case of Daniel Sickles' murder of Philip Barton Key II deserves to be remembered. In many ways, Daniel Edgar Sickles was the prototype of a 19th century politician. Handsome, well-spoken, and urbane, he was part of the powerful New York Democratic Tammany Hall political machine in the era of the notorious William Boss Tweed. Born the son of a New York politician in 1819, Sickles was the beneficiary of political patronage from a young age, studying for the bar under former U.S. Attorney General Benjamin Butler. Representing the enduring political loyalty of the era, Dan was quickly set along the path of a political career, being elected to the New York State Assembly in 1847. The machine of which Dan was a member was quite powerful. When an electoral opponent of a Tammany candidate tried to mail a circular to New York State voters in 1852, Dan rallied a mob of Tammany supporters, forcibly occupied the Broadway post office, and burned the flyers. Now, normally, interfering with the mail would lead to arrest and imprisonment, and at least the end of a political career. But Dan's Tammany Hall associates made sure that the case never came to trial, and if anything, his political career was enhanced by his felony. This was just one of many misdeeds of Dan Sickles that would have destroyed the political career of a less well-connected individual. In September of 1852, Sickles married Teresa de Pont Bajoli, the daughter of his friend and mentor Antonio Bajoli, an Italian composer and music teacher living in New York. Sickles had known Teresa Bajoli since she was a small child. At the time of the marriage, she was just 15 years old, and he was 32. She was known for being especially bright and mature for her age, speaking five languages. Both families opposed the marriage, and they were married in a civil ceremony, although they later held a church ceremony. Teresa was universally held to be very attractive and charming, and was very successful in society. But, among his other faults, Daniel Sickles was a womanizer. While he may have lied to Teresa about it, he was not shy about it in public. When, in 1853, he sailed to England to be part of the U.S. delegation with newly appointed Ambassador James Buchanan, Teresa was not able to come along, because their daughter Laura was considered too young to make an Atlantic crossing. So, instead, Dan brought a famous New York prostitute named Fanny White, with whom he had a long-time connection, with him to England, to the court of St. James, where he even introduced her to the Queen of England. When pressed by a friend over his indiscretions with women, he wrote in a letter, I have said to you before that I do not deem it a wise course, nor approve of it, nor recommend it to any friend, but I have adopted it. It is mine, and I will follow it, come what may. Sickles not only regularly kept with prostitutes, but engaged in many affairs with both married and unmarried women. After returning from London, Sickles served in the New York State Legislature. His political responsibilities and his womanizing often kept him away from Teresa and Laura, and letters from the time suggest that Teresa felt neglected. But in 1856, Sickles was elected to Congress. Teresa, only 20 years old and described as young, pretty, and very stylish, moved with him to Washington, D.C. It was in Washington, D.C. at the 1857 inauguration of Sickles' old friend James Buchanan as 15th President of the United States that the Sickles became acquainted with another well-connected politician and lawyer named Philip Barton Key II. Key's father, Francis Scott Key, was also a lawyer and during the War of 1812, while negotiating a prisoner exchange with the British, was briefly held aboard the British ship HMS Taunet during the Battle of Baltimore. He had penned a brief poem about the battle called Defense of Fort McHenry. Set to music, the poem, better known today as The Star-Spangled Banner, was quite popular in the United States in the 1850s, but would not officially become the national anthem until 1931. Francis Scott Key had a long career in law, including as the United States Attorney for the District of Columbia. 
In addition to his famous father, Philip Burton Key II, who usually went by Barton, was the nephew of Roger Taney, who was Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court from 1836 to 1864. In 1857, Barton Key was the District Attorney for Washington, D.C. A widower with four children, he was often described as the handsomest man in Washington society. By all accounts, Sickle took a liking to Key quickly and helped to ensure that he held on to his position under the new administration. As Sickles was still often too busy to accompany Teresa to all the events of Washington society, he apparently encouraged her to attend with his new friend, Barton. Their relationship over time became intimate. Barton, Key, and Teresa Sickles started to be seen together in Washington a lot, so much so that people began to talk, but distracted by his political responsibilities and his own sexual affairs, Daniel Sickles seemed not to notice. The affair became more brazen after Sickles' re-election in 1858. Key rented a house under an assumed name, where he and Teresa would meet. Reportedly, some of Key's associates warned him of the danger of his affair and the lack of care in which he conducted it, but apparently did not dissuade the lovers. But the affair couldn't stay hidden forever. On February 24th, 1859, Sickles was opening the daily correspondence on his desk, and in there was a yellow envelope that included a letter that was signed only with the initials RPG. The letter told him about his wife's affair, informed him about the house that Key had rented, and concluded, Sir, I assure you, he has as much use of your wife as you have. Sickles waited a day to have an associate check out the claim, but on the night of the 26th, he confronted Teresa and extracted a confession from her. The note went into embarrassing detail, including the detail that Mr. Key would stand in the park outside the Sickles' house and wave a handkerchief when he wanted to meet. It was thus not opportune for Mr. Key, who didn't know that the affair had been uncovered, that the very next day Dan Sickles looked out his window to see Mr. Key standing in the park, looking at their house, waving his hanky. Sickles came at Key in a rage and shouted, Key, you scoundrel! You have dishonored my house! You must die! Sickles pulled a derringer from his coat and shot, injuring Key's hand. Key stepped forward and the two struggled for a moment and Sickles dropped the gun. But Sickles shook free and pulled out another pistol. Unarmed, Key cried out, Don't murder me! And threw the only item he had with him, a pair of opera glasses, at Sickles. Sickles responded by shooting Key in the thigh. Sickles was yelling now, attracting witnesses. Key stumbled and said, I'm shot! Falling to the ground, he shouted, Don't shoot me! Murder! Murder! Sickles pulled the trigger again, but the gun misfired. Sickles cocked it another time and shot Key in the chest at close range. He then pointed at Key's head and pulled the trigger one more time, intending a coup de grace, but the gun again misfired. Witnesses finally pulled him away before he could try another shot. This all occurred on Pennsylvania Avenue in front of Lafayette Square in broad daylight within sight of the White House. Some bystanders carried Key away to a nearby tavern where a doctor who had come running after hearing the shots examined him. The bullet to the chest had punctured his liver and blood was filling his chest cavity. He was drowning in his own blood. The doctor asked Key if he had any last messages for his children, but he was unable to respond. He expired shortly thereafter. Dan Sickles went to the house of a friend, a man named Jeremiah Black, who was the Attorney General of the United States, and surrendered his pistol. Black summoned the police to take Sickles to a magistrate. At this point, you might think things looked bad for Daniel Sickles, what with the murdering an unarmed man in cold blood in front of witnesses in broad daylight a block from the White House. That might even undo the career of a politically well-connected congressman, were it not for a Scottish woodturner named Daniel McNaughton. In London, in January of 1843, Mr. McNaughton had shot a civil servant named Edward Drummond, apparently thinking that he was the British Prime Minister, Mr. Robert Peel. It turns out that Mr. McNaughton had delusions of persecution. Mr. McNaughton was found not guilty by reason of insanity and spent the rest of his life in various asylums. The standards created in his case became known as the McNaughton Rules and were used as a precedent in many common law countries, including the United States. They stipulate that every man is presumed to be sane and that to establish a defense on the ground of insanity, it must be clearly proved that at the time of committing the act, the party accused was laboring under such a defective reason from disease of the mind as not to know the nature and quality of the act he was doing, or if he did know it, that he did not know what he was doing was wrong. Sickles hired multiple attorneys for his defense, including Edwin Stanton, a nationally renowned attorney and close associate of Attorney General Black, and of course, the future U.S. Secretary of War. 
But chief among Sickles' legal team was James Topham Brady, a renowned New York criminal attorney and part of the Tammany Hall circle, who had ever only lost one criminal case. While much of the public was sympathetic to Sickles, the case was very challenging. The defense team used a novel twist of the insanity defense in the McNaughton rules, that of temporary insanity, arguing that Sickles was so overcome by news of the affair that he temporarily was unable to distinguish right from wrong. In fact, the public opinion had turned in Sickles' favor, and society reeled at Key's behavior with a married woman and Teresa's moral turpitude, ironic given Sickles' history of womanizing. The jury deliberated for just over an hour before declaring a verdict of not guilty. The verdict met with wide national approval. Setting aside the relevance of the temporary insanity defense, it's clear that Sickles was treated differently throughout the process. While he was in jail, for example, he was allowed to use the warden's office. His meals were catered by a fine hotel, and he was allowed open access to visitors, which included, for example, the mayor of Washington, D.C., and the U.S. Attorney General. Ironically, Sickles had killed the man who would usually prosecute the crime of murder in Washington, D.C., the district attorney. As it was a federal district, his replacement was appointed by President Buchanan, a political ally and personal friend of Daniel Sickles, whom some claim had bribed a witness to the murder to leave town. Many argued the man he appointed as the new DA, Robert Old, was not up to the task of the prosecution. For example, it was very strange, given the defense used, that Old failed to present evidence of Sickles' own history of infidelity. Despite the initial public support for his acquittal, Sickles then did something that enraged the public. He forgave Teresa, and they remained married until her death from tuberculosis in 1867. The public was angry because the entire defense argument had been that her actions were so unforgivable that Key's punishment was justified. His reputation in tatters, Sickles decided not to run for re-election to Congress, and once again, a lesser man's career might have been destroyed. But shortly thereafter, in 1861, the U.S. Civil War started, and Daniel Sickles would again rise to national attention, this time as a major general in the Union Army, one that, unsurprisingly, was surrounded by controversy. The saga of Daniel Sickles would continue. I'm the History Guy, and I hope you enjoyed this edition of my series of short snippets of forgotten history about 10 minutes long. And if you did enjoy it, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button, which is there on your left. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. And if you'd like more snippets of forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.